last time I introduced the concept of the efficient frontier, which provides options for the most efficient allocations in a portfolio. But it doesn't provide us with the most optimal portfolio configuration to meet our portfolio risk and return objectives. That is where the capital allocation line comes into play. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. So let's now build on what we did last time and see how the capital allocation line operates alongside the efficient frontier. So before we make a start, I'm going to do a very quick summary of some of the key terminology because we'll need to understand this in order to understand how the capital allocation line relates to the efficient frontier. So I'll go over that very briefly in a moment. But as soon as we've done that, I'll then be concentrating for the rest of the episode on this capital allocation line. Okay, so we have our chart of risk versus expected return. And the minimum variance optimization or MVO is actually a process or a technique that is used in order to calculate what's known as the minimum variance frontier that we can see in green here. And the points that lie on this green curve represent the various combinations of risk and expected return that can be achieved using different allocations for the assets in the portfolio. Now, the point here on the curve that exhibits the minimum amount of risk is what's commonly known as the global minimum variance portfolio. And so by constructing those allocations in a particular way would achieve this minimal risk version of the portfolio. Anything that's north of this point is what's known as the efficient frontier. And to be honest, I'm not sure if the lower part of the curve has a name, but if you want to, you could call it the inefficient frontier. We would not want to be selecting portfolios that lie on this lower part of the curve. And the reason for that is quite simple. For any given level of risk, this can cross the curve at two points. And because this is a line that's parallel to the y-axis, this represents a consistent level of portfolio risk for each of the points. But of course, the difference is that they have different levels of return. The return of the upper configuration is much better than that of the lower. And so you would never select this as your portfolio construction you would always select this value for this level of risk because the return is higher. Why wouldn't you? But there is of course now a question. Okay, we might want to construct our portfolio so that it lies on the black line, the efficient frontier, but where on that black line is the best place? And one of the things that helps to answer that is what's called the capital allocation line. So let's take a look now. In modern portfolio theory, there's the concept not just of building a portfolio from a selection of assets such as stocks. There's also the concept of blending that with lower risk or even no risk assets. So for example, treasury bonds that are backed by the government and carry a very low risk 
And although, of course, nothing actually has zero risk, these do often get termed as having a risk-free rate of return. And so I've represented that at this level here on the y-axis. Now, the capital allocation line is always constructed from this point on the y-axis up to the efficient frontier. And it actually forms a tangent with that curve. So it touches it at just one point. So we've actually now got two parts to a portfolio construction process. The first of those is to get the right blend of stocks, which provides us with the efficient frontier line, the black line. But then as a secondary, you can blend those ratios of stocks with a risk-free asset such as a treasury bond. And by doing that, we can actually adjust to a desired risk level of an investor. So let's assume that we've now already done our construction of the efficient frontier. So we're going to move on to this second part, which is the blending of that with the risk-free rate asset. So let's first look at two extreme examples. The first is where we put 100% of our capital into the risk-free asset. We have zero or close to zero risk, and the return we're going to get is that risk-free return. At the other end of the spectrum, however, if we choose this point here, this means that we're fully invested in this active portfolio of, let's say, stocks. And we don't have any allocation whatsoever in the risk-free asset. And so at this point, we lie on the efficient frontier. But what we can now do is for a particular investor who has a particular risk appetite and a certain level of risk that they want to invest under, we can say, if this is that level, then this is how the portfolio should be constructed. And furthermore, this is the expected return. Now, obviously, in future episodes, I'm going to talk about how these techniques relate to position sizing for day traders, which isn't really what these techniques were designed for, but they do tend to work very well. And I don't know about you, but I don't invest in bonds. And so this whole concept of a risk-free return isn't part of my day-to-day -day trading activities. So you might think that this won't apply. However, by adapting the use of this capital allocation line, it can actually help inform the point on the efficient frontier that we should be targeting as part of daily trading activities, which is the reason I wanted to, first of all, cover this in its traditional context, so that then you can see how we can adapt this later on down the line. So we've had two episodes there where we've covered some theory. We've covered lots of terminology. And for many of you, these will all be new concepts. So what we need to do next is to make this real. And the best way of doing that is to construct everything we've seen so far in Excel. We'll do this from first principles. So I'll be using real stock data and performing all of the calculations from that basic price data to illustrate everything we've seen in these first two episodes. And I'm sure that once you've seen that, if you are feeling a little bit mystified about how this can be used, all of that will now be clarified. And at that point, we'll of course be in the position to then start looking at how to adapt these to a day trading context. Now, some of you who are new to DarwinX might not know about the kind of services that we provide to traders. And if that's the case, then you can click on the button at the bottom right here that says DarwinX to go to our website and take a look at the kind of things that we offer. But now, until next time, trade safe.